Welcome to Stoicism Philosophy Channel. In today's video, we're continuing our self-development series from the previous episodes. If you're new here or missed the last one, you can check out all the episodes in the playlist that will pop up at the end of this video. These lessons aren't just educational content, they're a daily, all-encompassing approach to life. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you're digging this series, show some love by liking the video and dropping a keep it up in the comments below. Life is much like an elaborate banquet, where each moment offers us a variety of experiences and flavors. Just as a gourmet meal requires careful attention to ingredients, preparation, and presentation, living a fulfilling life demands mindfulness, variety, and balance. This metaphor extends beyond mere enjoyment of moments to embracing life's richness, just as one would savor each bite of a well-prepared dish. In this grand feast, the menu is diverse, featuring love, joy, pain, sorrow, success, and failure. How we choose and savor these experiences defines our overall satisfaction and growth. Epicurus, the ancient philosopher, emphasized that while pleasure is essential, moderation is crucial. This idea of selective indulgence can help us avoid the life coma, the state of being overwhelmed by excessive or unbalanced experiences. Moreover, savoring life involves slowing down and being present. Poet Rumi's advice, let the beauty of what you love be what you do, echoes this sentiment. It's about finding joy in simple things, appreciating the present, and truly experiencing the richness of life. Mindfulness, much like mindful eating, requires us to pay attention to the present moment, our thoughts, and our emotions, allowing us to fully engage with life's banquet. Diversity in experiences, akin to variety in a meal, is also vital. Embracing different cultures, trying new activities, and stepping out of our comfort zones enrich our lives. The phrase, variety is the spice of life, aptly captures this notion, reminding us to seek out and appreciate the multitude of experiences available to us. However, moderation remains key. Just as overindulging in food can lead to discomfort, Overindulging in any aspect of life can result in burnout or dissatisfaction. Finding a balance that works for us ensures we enjoy life's offerings without detrimental effects. Additionally, sharing our experiences with others enhances our enjoyment and creates meaningful connections, aligning with Aristotle's view that humans are inherently social beings. Real-world examples illustrate these concepts. The adventurous traveler immerses themselves in local cultures, savoring each unique experience. The passionate artist creates for joy and expression, not merely for fame. The lifelong learner constantly seeks new knowledge, viewing life as a continuous journey of growth. These examples show that by practicing mindful living, embracing variety, and sharing our experiences, we can turn life's banquet into a truly fulfilling feast. Lesson 1. The Banquet of Life. Your Philosophical Guide to Feasting Without the Food. All right, folks, let's talk about life as a banquet. No, we're not talking about an all-you-can-eat buffet or a fancy five-course meal, although those can be pretty awesome. We're talking about the metaphor of life as a feast, a rich and varied experience filled with flavors, textures, and aromas. The Menu of Life. Life offers us a vast menu of experiences. Love, joy, pain, sorrow, success, failure, and everything in between. It's up to us to choose what we want to sample, how much we want to indulge, and how we want to savor each bite. As the philosopher Epicurus put it, pleasure is the beginning and end of the blessed life. But he also emphasized the importance of moderation and choosing pleasures wisely. The art of savoring. Just like a good meal, life is meant to be savored. It's not about rushing through each course or gorging ourselves on empty calories. It's about slowing down, paying attention to the flavors and textures, and appreciating the experience as a whole. As the poet Rumi said, let the beauty of what you love be what you do. In other words, find joy in the simple things, appreciate the present moment, and savor the richness of life. The Philosophical Foodie 
1. Mindful Eating Just like mindful eating, where we pay attention to the taste, texture, and aroma of our food, mindful living involves paying attention to the present moment, our thoughts, our emotions, and our experiences. 2. Variety is the spice of life. Don't limit yourself to a single flavor or cuisine. Explore different cultures, try new things, and step outside your comfort zone. As the saying goes, variety is the spice of life. 3. Moderation is key. Just like overindulging in food can lead to a food coma, overindulging in any aspect of life can lead to burnout, addiction, or unhappiness. Find a balance that works for you and enjoy everything in moderation. 4. Sharing is caring. A meal is best enjoyed when shared with others. The same goes for life. Connect with loved ones, build meaningful relationships, and contribute to your community. As the philosopher Aristotle put it, man is by nature a social animal. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The adventurous traveler doesn't just visit tourist attractions. They immerse themselves in the local culture, try new foods, learn new languages, and connect with people from different backgrounds. The passionate artist doesn't just create art for fame or fortune. They create art for the sheer joy of expression, for the thrill of exploring new ideas, and for the satisfaction of sharing their work with others. The lifelong learner doesn't just go to school to get a degree. They're constantly seeking out new knowledge, new skills, and new experiences. They see life as a never-ending journey of learning and growth. The bottom line, life is a banquet, but it's up to us to make it a feast. By practicing mindful living, embracing variety, practicing moderation, and sharing our experiences with others, we can savor the richness of life and create a truly fulfilling experience. As the philosopher Epicurus put it, the wealth required by nature is limited and is easy to procure, but the wealth required by vain ideals extends to infinity. Lesson 2. The Grand Parade of Desire, Your Brain's Craving Carnival, and How to Manage the Mayhem. All right, folks. Grab a front row seat because we're about to witness the Grand Parade of Desire. No, we're not talking about a Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade with giant balloons and marching bands. We're talking about the endless stream of cravings, urges, and wants that march through our minds every day, vying for our attention and demanding to be satisfied. The Craving Conundrum Our brains are wired to crave. It's a survival mechanism that helped our ancestors seek out food, water, and shelter. But in today's world of abundance and instant gratification, our cravings can easily get out of hand. We crave sugary snacks, social media likes, the latest gadgets, and the approval of others. As the philosopher Plato put it, good and evil, which divide and compound man's dual nature, are rooted in the appetites and aversions present in the soul. In other words, our desires can lead us towards both good and evil, depending on how we manage them. The Dopamine Dance our cravings are fueled by dopamine, a neurotransmitter that's associated with pleasure, reward, and motivation. When we anticipate or experience something pleasurable, our brains release dopamine, which gives us a temporary high. But the more we indulge in our cravings, the more our brains adapt and the less dopamine we produce. This leads us to crave even more, creating a vicious cycle of desire and dissatisfaction. The Art of Desire Management 1. Awareness is key. The first step to managing your desires is to become aware of them. What are your triggers? What situations, emotions, or thoughts tend to set off your cravings? Once you're aware of your triggers, you can start to develop strategies for dealing with them. 2. Question your cravings. Don't just give in to every craving that comes your way. Ask yourself, is this really what I want? Will this truly make me happy? What are the potential consequences of indulging in this desire? 3. Practice Delayed Gratification The ability to delay gratification is a key skill for managing desire. Instead of giving in to every impulse, practice waiting, saving, and working towards your goals. As the saying goes, 
Good things come to those who wait. 4. Find healthy alternatives. Instead of indulging in unhealthy cravings, find healthier ways to satisfy your needs. If you're craving sugar, try eating a piece of fruit. If you're craving social interaction, call a friend or go for a walk with a loved one. 5. Cultivate contentment. True happiness comes from within, not from external things. Learn to appreciate what you have rather than focusing on what you lack. As the philosopher Epictetus put it, wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The social media scroller. Instead of mindlessly scrolling through social media, the social media scroller sets limits on their screen time and engages in more fulfilling activities offline. The emotional eater. Instead of reaching for junk food when they're feeling stressed or sad, the emotional eater learns to identify their emotions and find healthier ways to cope, such as exercise, meditation, or talking to a friend. The shopaholic. Instead of buying things they don't need, the shopaholic creates a budget, focuses on experiences rather than material possessions, and finds joy in giving to others. The bottom line. Desire is a natural part of the human experience, but it doesn't have to control us. By becoming aware of our cravings, questioning our impulses, practicing delayed gratification, finding healthy alternatives, and cultivating contentment, we can manage our desires and create a life that's more balanced, fulfilling, and joyful. As the philosopher Aristotle put it, the ultimate value of life depends upon awareness and the power of contemplation rather than upon mere survival. Lesson 3. Wish not, want not. The art of contentment in a world of want. All right, folks, let's dive into a concept that's kind of like a life hack for happiness. Wish not, want not. Now I know what you're thinking. Easy for you to say, philosophy guru. But I want that new phone, car, designer handbag. But hold your horses because we're not talking about denying yourself basic needs or pleasures. We're talking about a mindset shift, a way of approaching life that can lead to a deeper, more lasting sense of satisfaction, the wanting whirlpool. Let's be real. We live in a world that's constantly telling us we need more stuff to be happy. We're bombarded with ads, social media posts, and peer pressure that make us feel like we're missing out if we don't have the latest and greatest. It's a never-ending cycle of wanting, getting, and then wanting something else. But here's the kicker. This constant craving is a recipe for unhappiness. As the philosopher Schopenhauer put it, wealth is like seawater. The more we drink, the thirstier we become. In other words, the more we chase after external things, the more we want, and the less satisfied we feel. The contentment compass. So how do we break free from this wanting whirlpool and find a calm, more contented state of mind? 1. Gratitude Attitude. Instead of focusing on what you lack, focus on what you have. Take time each day to appreciate the good things in your life, your health, your loved ones, your home, your talents. As the saying goes, gratitude turns what we have into enough. 2. Needs versus wants. Get clear on the difference between your needs and your wants. Needs are the things that are essential for your survival and well being food, water, shelter, clothing. Wants are the things that are nice to have but not necessary the latest iPhone, designer clothes, a fancy car. By focusing on your needs and being mindful of your wants, you can avoid getting caught up in the endless cycle of consumerism. 3. Mindful consumption. When you do indulge in your wants, do so mindfully. Savor the experience, appreciate the craftsmanship, and be grateful for the opportunity to enjoy it. Don't let your wants become mindless habits or compulsive behaviors. 4. Find joy in the simple things. Happiness isn't about having a lot of stuff. It's about appreciating the simple pleasures of life, a good conversation, a walk in nature, a home-cooked meal. As the poet Rumi said, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. 5. Cultivate inner peace. 
True contentment comes from within, not from external things. Practice mindfulness, meditation, or other spiritual practices that help you connect with your inner self and find peace in the present moment. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Minimalist Movement The minimalist movement is all about simplifying your life by focusing on what truly matters and letting go of excess stuff. Minimalists have found that by owning less, they actually have more. More time, more freedom, more peace of mind. The Gratitude Journal Keeping a gratitude journal is a simple yet powerful way to cultivate contentment. By writing down three things you're grateful for each day, you can train your brain to focus on the positive and appreciate the abundance in your life. The Experience Economy The rise of the experience economy shows that people are increasingly valuing experiences over material possessions. Instead of buying the latest gadget, people are spending their money on travel, concerts, workshops, and other experiences that create lasting memories. The bottom line. Wish not, want not is not about deprivation or self-denial. It's about finding a balance between our needs and wants, appreciating what we have, and cultivating a sense of contentment that comes from within. As the philosopher Epicurus put it, he is a wise man who does not grieve for the things which he has not, but rejoices for those which he has eeping secrets, or hiding the truth. We're talking about the art of discretion, the we. Lesson 4. What's Better Left Unsaid? Your Guide to Taming Your TMI Monster. All right, folks, let's have a real talk about something we all struggle with, knowing when to shut our traps. No, we're not talking about keeping secrets or hiding the truth. We're talking about the art of discretion, the wisdom of knowing what's better left unsaid, and the power of silence in a world that's constantly bombarding us with noise. The Oversharing Epidemic Let's face it, we live in an age of oversharing. Social media has turned us into a generation of TMI, too much information addicts. We post every detail of our lives online, from what we had for breakfast to our deepest insecurities. We vent our frustrations on Twitter, air our dirty laundry on Facebook, and share our opinions on everything from politics to pop culture. But here's the thing. Not everything needs to be shared. Some things are better left unsaid, for our own sake and for the sake of others. The Philosophical Filter The ancient philosophers like Socrates and Confucius understood the importance of discretion. They believed that words have power and that we should choose our words carefully. As Socrates put it, strong minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, weak minds discuss people. So how do we develop a philosophical filter for our words and avoid the pitfalls of oversharing? 1. The Think Before You Speak Challenge Before you open your mouth or hit send, take a moment to pause and reflect. Ask yourself, is this necessary? Is this kind? Is this helpful? Is this the right time and place to say this? 2. The Empathy Test Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would you feel if someone said this to you? Would it hurt your feelings? Would it damage your relationship? If so, maybe it's better left unsaid. 3. The Confidentiality Clause Respect other people's privacy. Don't share personal information about others without their permission. Gossip is a toxic form of communication that can damage relationships and reputations. 4. The silent treatment for yourself. Sometimes the best thing to do is to say nothing at all. Silence can be a powerful tool for communication. It can allow space for reflection, create a sense of mystery, and even diffuse a tense situation. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The office gossip. Instead of chiming in with your own juicy tidbit, change the subject or excuse yourself from the conversation. The social media rant. Before you post that angry rant on Facebook, take a deep breath and consider whether it's really worth it. Will it actually solve the problem or just make you feel worse? The TMI friend. If your friend is constantly oversharing, gently set boundaries. Let them know that you value their friendship. 
but you're not comfortable hearing every detail of their personal life. The bottom line. Knowing what to say and what to leave unsaid is a valuable life skill. It can help you build stronger relationships, avoid unnecessary conflict, and protect your own peace of mind. As the philosopher Confucius said, silence is a true friend who never betrays. Lesson 5. Circumstances have no care for our feelings. Life's a beach. Then you philosophize. All right, folks. Let's have a real talk about life's curveballs. We're not talking about the kind you see on a baseball field, but the unexpected twists and turns that life throws our way. We're talking about the job losses, the breakups, the health scares, the flat tires on a rainy day, the whole shebang, the illusion of control. We like to think we're in control of our lives, that we can plan and predict our way to happiness and success. But the truth is, life is messy, unpredictable, and often downright unfair. Things happen that are completely out of our control, and sometimes those things suck. As the Stoic philosopher Epictetus put it, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. In other words, we can't control the events of our lives, but we can control our response to them. The emotional roller coaster. When life throws us a curveball, it's natural to feel a range of emotions, anger, sadness, frustration, disappointment. But if we let those emotions control us, we risk getting stuck in a cycle of negativity and despair. As the philosopher Seneca said, we suffer more often in imagination than in reality. In other words, we often make things worse by catastrophizing, dwelling on the negative, and refusing to accept what is. The Stoic Survival Guide the ancient Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca developed a philosophy that emphasized resilience, acceptance, and the importance of focusing on what we can control. They understood that life is full of challenges, but they also believed that we have the power to choose our response to those challenges. So how do we channel our inner Stoic and navigate life's curveballs with grace and equanimity? 1. Acceptance the first step is to accept that life is unpredictable and that things won't always go our way. This doesn't mean giving up or becoming passive. It means acknowledging reality and choosing to focus on what we can control. 2. Perspective When faced with a setback, try to see it in perspective. Is it really the end of the world? Is it something you can learn from and grow from? As the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 3. Action. Instead of dwelling on what you can't control, focus on what you can do. Take action, make a plan, and move forward. As the philosopher Confucius said, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. 4. Gratitude. Even in the midst of adversity, there's always something to be grateful for. Take time each day to appreciate the good things in your life, your health, your loved ones, your basic needs. Gratitude can help you shift your focus from what's wrong to what's right. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The job loss. Instead of wallowing in self-pity, the person who lost their job updates their resume, networks with contacts, and starts exploring new career opportunities. They see this setback as a chance to reinvent themselves and pursue their passions. The breakup. Instead of dwelling on the past, the person who's going through a breakup focuses on self care, reconnects with friends and family, and pursues new hobbies and interests. They see this as an opportunity for growth and self discovery. The health scare. Instead of giving in to fear and despair, the person facing a health scare seeks out the best possible treatment, makes lifestyle changes, and focuses on staying positive and hopeful. They see this as a challenge to overcome and an opportunity to prioritize their health and well-being. The bottom line, life is full of unexpected twists and turns, but by accepting what we can't control, focusing on what we can, practicing gratitude, and taking action, we can navigate life's challenges with resilience, grace, and even a touch of humor. As the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, that which does not kill us makes us stronger.
Lesson 6. The Real Source of Harm What's really hurting you ain't what you think. All right, folks, let's get real about something that's been bugging humanity since, well, forever. Harm. We're not talking about stub toes or paper cuts here. We're diving deep into the gnarly stuff, the emotional pain, the mental anguish, the existential dread that can leave us feeling like we've been hit by a truck, the usual suspects. When we think about what causes us harm, we usually point the finger at external factors. It's that jerk who cut us off in traffic, the boss who yelled at us, the friend who betrayed us, the news cycle that's a never-ending dumpster fire. But here's the kicker. While those things can definitely sting, they're not the real source of our suffering. The philosophical smackdown, the ancient Stoics, those wise dudes from way back, had a different take on this whole harm thing. They believed that it's not the external events themselves that cause us pain, but our judgment of those events. As Epictetus put it, people are not disturbed by things but by the views they take of them. In other words, it's not the breakup that's killing you. It's the story you're telling yourself about the breakup. The I'll never find love again or I'm not good enough narrative that's playing on repeat in your head. The judgment jukebox. Think of your mind like a jukebox. It's got a whole bunch of records, beliefs, assumptions, interpretations that it can play. When something bad happens, it's easy to let the jukebox default to the woe is me playlist. But here's the thing. You have the power to change the record. You can choose to play a different tune, one that's more empowering, more resilient, more aligned with your values. So how do we reprogram our mental jukebox and stop letting external events dictate our emotional state? 1. Awareness is key. The first step is to become aware of your thoughts and judgments. When something bad happens, notice how you're interpreting the situation. Are you catastrophizing? Are you personalizing? Are you jumping to conclusions? 2. Challenge your assumptions. Don't just accept your thoughts as gospel truth. Question them, challenge them, and look for evidence to support or refute them. As the philosopher Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. 3. Reframe your perspective. Instead of focusing on the negative, look for the silver lining. What can you learn from this experience? How can you grow stronger as a result? As the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 4. Choose your response. You can't always control what happens to you, but you can always control how you respond. You can choose to react with anger, resentment, and self-pity. Or you can choose to respond with grace, compassion, and understanding. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The fired employee. Instead of seeing their job loss as a personal failure, they can reframe it as an opportunity for growth and a chance to pursue a more fulfilling career. The cheated on partner. Instead of wallowing in self-blame and resentment, they can choose to forgive their partner or not, learn from the experience, and move on with their life. The Criticized Artist Instead of internalizing the criticism and doubting their talent, they can use it as feedback to improve their work and grow as an artist. The bottom line, the real source of harm isn't out there in the world, it's in our own minds. By becoming aware of our thoughts, challenging our assumptions, reframing our perspective, and choosing our response, we can break free from the cycle of suffering and create a life that's more resilient, joyful, and fulfilling. Lesson 7. Timeless Wisdom. Your Cheat Codes for Life. Ancient Philosopher's Edition. All right, folks, let's talk about wisdom. Not the I've lived a long life and seen it all kind of wisdom, but the timeless kind that's been passed down through the ages from some of the greatest minds in history. We're talking about the wisdom of the ancient philosophers, those deep thinkers who pondered the big questions of life, the universe, and everything. The Wisdom Wellspring Think of the ancient philosophers as a wellspring of wisdom, a source of timeless insights that can still guide us today. These guys weren't just armchair intellectuals. They were actively engaged in the world, 
grappling with the same challenges and dilemmas that we face today. Love, loss, fear, ambition, meaning, purpose. As the philosopher Socrates famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But we could also say, the unexamined wisdom is not worth having. So why should we tap into this ancient wisdom? What can it offer us in our modern lives? One, perspective shift. The ancient philosophers offer us a different lens through which to view the world. They challenge our assumptions, broaden our perspectives, and help us see things in a new light. It's like putting on a pair of x-ray glasses and seeing beneath the surface of things. 2. Timeless Truths While the world has changed a lot since the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans, human nature hasn't. The same fears, desires, and struggles that plagued them still plague us today. The wisdom of the ancient philosophers offers timeless insights into these universal human experiences. 3. Practical Guidance The ancient philosophers weren't just interested in abstract theories. They were also concerned with practical ethics, how to live a good life, and how to navigate the challenges of the human condition. Their teachings offer practical guidance for everything from managing our emotions, to building strong relationships, to finding meaning and purpose in life real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The Stoic CEO Many successful CEOs like Tim Ferriss and Ryan Holiday have embraced Stoic philosophy as a way to manage stress, make better decisions, and live a more fulfilling life. They found that the Stoic emphasis on virtue, reason, and acceptance can be incredibly helpful in the high-pressure world of business. The Mindful Meditator Mindfulness meditation, which has its roots in Buddhist philosophy, has become increasingly popular in recent years as a way to reduce stress, improve focus, and cultivate inner peace. The Modern Philosopher There are countless modern philosophers who are building on the wisdom of the ancients and applying it to contemporary issues. They're exploring topics like artificial intelligence, climate change, social justice, and the meaning of life in a digital age. How to tap into timeless wisdom, your philosophical cheat sheet. 1. Read the classics. Start by reading the works of the ancient philosophers Plato, Aristotle, Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. You can find their writings online in libraries or in bookstores. 2. Join a book club or discussion group. Discussing philosophical ideas with others can help you deepen your understanding and gain new insights. 3. Seek out modern interpretations. Many modern authors and thinkers have written books and articles that interpret and apply ancient philosophy to modern life. Check out works by Ryan Holiday, Massimo Pigliucci, and William Irvine, to name a few. 4. Apply what you learn. Don't just read about philosophy. Live it. Put the principles you learn into practice in your daily life. Experiment with different techniques and see what works for you. The bottom line. The wisdom of the ancient philosophers is not just for academics or history buffs. It's a treasure trove of timeless insights that can help us navigate the challenges of modern life, find meaning and purpose, and live a more fulfilling life. As the philosopher Seneca said, Life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. Lesson 8. Ready and at home. Your philosophical guide to finding your chill spot in a world gone wild. All right, folks, let's talk about feeling at home. No, we're not talking about your actual house or apartment, although those are important too. We're talking about that feeling of inner peace, contentment, and belonging that can be elusive in our fast-paced, ever-changing world, the homelessness epidemic. In today's world, it's easy to feel like we're constantly on the move, chasing after the next big thing, never quite feeling settled or at peace. We're bombarded with messages telling us we need to be more productive, more successful, more connected. But all this striving can leave us feeling empty, exhausted, and disconnected from ourselves. As the philosopher Seneca put it, it is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. 
In other words, true wealth lies not in external possessions or achievements, but in inner peace and contentment. The philosophical home base. The ancient Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus believe that true happiness comes from within, not from external circumstances. They taught that we can find peace and contentment by focusing on what we can control. Our thoughts, our actions, our values, and accepting what we can't control. The weather, other people's opinions, the economy. As Marcus Aurelius put it, Nowhere can man find a quieter or more untroubled retreat than in his own soul. So how do we create a home within ourselves, a place of refuge where we can always feel safe, secure, and at peace? 1. Cultivate inner peace. This means learning to quiet the mind, manage our emotions, and find a sense of stillness in the midst of chaos. Practices like meditation, mindfulness, and yoga can be helpful tools for cultivating inner peace. 2. Connect with your values. What are the things that are most important to you? What are your core beliefs and principles? By connecting with our values, we create a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives which can help us feel more grounded and at home in the world. 3. Build strong relationships. We are social creatures, and our relationships are essential to our well-being. Invest time and energy in building strong, supportive relationships with family, friends, and loved ones. These relationships can provide a sense of belonging, love, and security. 4. Embrace simplicity. Our lives are often cluttered with material possessions, commitments, and distractions. By simplifying our lives, we can create more space for what truly matters and find more peace and contentment in the present moment. 5. Find your happy place. This could be a physical place like a cozy corner in your home, a park bench, or a quiet beach, or it could be a mental space like a hobby you enjoy, a creative project you're working on, or a spiritual practice that brings you peace. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The digital nomad. Digital nomads are people who work remotely and travel the world. While they might not have a traditional home, they often create a sense of home wherever they go by establishing routines, connecting with local communities, and finding spaces where they feel comfortable and at peace. The minimalist family. Minimalist families have intentionally downsized their possessions and simplified their lives. They found that by owning less, they have more time and energy to focus on what truly matters, their relationships, their health, and their passions. The Zen Master Zen Masters are known for their ability to find peace and tranquility in the midst of chaos. They cultivate mindfulness, practice meditation, and live in accordance with their values. The bottom line, feeling at home is not about having a fancy house or a lot of stuff. It's about cultivating inner peace, connecting with your values, building strong relationships, embracing simplicity, and finding your happy place. As the philosopher Lao Tzu put it, be content with what you have. Rejoice in the way things are. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. Lesson 9 the best retreat is in here, not out there. Your mind's the ultimate station. All right, folks, let's talk about finding peace and quiet in this crazy, chaotic world. We're not talking about booking a fancy spa retreat or jetting off to a remote island, although those sound pretty sweet. We're talking about a different kind of retreat, one that's always available to you no matter where you are or what's going on in your life. We're talking about the retreat into your own mind. The Retreat Mirage We often think of retreats as physical escapes, a chance to get away from it all, to disconnect from the daily grind, and to recharge our batteries. And while those things can be beneficial, they're not always possible or practical. Plus, they don't address the root of the problem, the fact that our minds are often the source of our own stress and anxiety. As the philosopher Seneca put it, it is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more, that is poor. In other words, true peace and contentment come from within, not from external circumstances. The Inner Sanctuary 
The ancient Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus understood the importance of cultivating an inner sanctuary, a place of calm, clarity, and resilience that we can access at any time. They believed that by training our minds, we can find peace and tranquility, even in the midst of chaos. As Marcus Aurelius put it, nowhere can man find a quieter or more untroubled retreat than in his own soul. So how do we create this inner sanctuary and make our minds our ultimate station? 1. Mindfulness Meditation Mindfulness is the practice of paying attention to the present moment without judgment. It's about observing our thoughts and feelings without getting caught up in them. Regular mindfulness practice can help us cultivate a sense of inner peace and calm. 2. Journaling Writing down our thoughts and feelings can be a powerful way to process emotions, gain clarity, and connect with our inner selves. It's like having a therapy session with yourself without the copay. 3. Nature Therapy Spending time in nature has been shown to have numerous benefits for our mental and physical health. It can reduce stress, improve mood, and boost creativity. So take a walk in the park, go for a hike in the woods, or simply sit outside and soak up the sun. 4. Creative Expression Engaging in creative activities like painting, writing, music, or dance can be a form of meditation in motion. It allows us to tap into our subconscious mind, express our emotions, and find a sense of flow. 5. Philosophical Reflection Reading philosophy, contemplating life's big questions, and engaging in deep conversations can help us gain perspective, challenge our assumptions, and find meaning and purpose in our lives. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The stressed-out executive. Instead of booking a last-minute flight to a tropical island, the stressed-out executive takes a few minutes each day to meditate, journal, and connect with nature. They find that these simple practices help them manage their stress and find more balance in their life. The anxious artist. Instead of turning to drugs or alcohol to numb their anxiety, the anxious artist finds solace in their creative practice. They paint, write, or play music as a way to process their emotions and find a sense of calm. The overwhelmed parent. Instead of escaping to a spa for a weekend, the overwhelmed parent takes a few moments each day to practice mindfulness, read a book, or simply sit in silence. They find that these small breaks help them recharge their batteries and be more present for their children. The bottom line. The best retreat is not out there somewhere. It's within you. By cultivating inner peace, connecting with your values, and finding healthy ways to manage stress and anxiety, you can create a sanctuary within yourself that you can access at any time. As the philosopher Lao Tzu said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So take that first step today and start exploring the vast landscape of your own mind. Lesson 10. The Sign of True Education. It's not about the grades. All right, folks, let's have a real talk about education. We're not talking about cramming for exams or chasing after fancy degrees, although those can be useful tools. We're talking about the deeper, more transformative kind of education that shapes who we are, how we think, and how we interact with the world. The education illusion. In our society, education is often equated with academic achievement. We measure success by grades, test scores, and the prestige of the institutions we attend. But is that really what education is all about? As the philosopher Socrates famously said, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. In other words, true education is not about memorizing facts and figures. It's about learning how to think critically, creatively, and independently. The educated mind. An educated mind is not just a repository of information. It's a dynamic, adaptable tool for navigating the complexities of life. It's a mind that's open to new ideas, curious about the world, and willing to challenge its own assumptions. As the philosopher Aristotle put it, the educated differ from the uneducated as much as the living differ from the dead. 
In other words, education is not just about acquiring knowledge. It's about coming alive, awakening to the full potential of our minds and our spirits. So what are the signs of a truly educated person? 1. Curiosity. A truly educated person is insatiably curious. They're always asking questions, seeking out new information, and exploring different perspectives. They're not afraid to challenge the status quo or to question their own beliefs. 2. Critical thinking. A truly educated person is a critical thinker. They're able to analyze information, evaluate evidence, and draw their own conclusions. They're not easily swayed by propaganda, misinformation, or emotional appeals. 3. Open-mindedness. A truly educated person is open-minded. They're willing to consider different viewpoints, even if they don't agree with them. They're not afraid to change their minds when presented with new evidence or a compelling argument. 4. Empathy. A truly educated person is empathetic. They're able to understand and share the feelings of others. They're compassionate, kind, and respectful of different cultures and perspectives. 5. Humility. A truly educated person is humble. They recognize that they don't have all the answers, and they're always open to learning more. They're not afraid to admit when they're wrong or to ask for help when they need it. Real-world examples. Let's explore how this concept is applied in daily life. The self-taught programmer. The self-taught programmer didn't go to a fancy university, but they're constantly learning new coding languages, experimenting with new technologies, and building innovative products. They're a testament to the power of curiosity, self-directed learning, and a growth mindset. The Lifelong Learner The lifelong learner is always taking courses, attending workshops, reading books, and engaging in intellectual conversations. They see education as a lifelong journey, not a destination. The Thoughtful Citizen The thoughtful citizen is engaged in their community, informed about current events, and willing to participate in civil discourse. They understand that democracy depends on an educated citizenry, and they take their responsibility seriously. The Bottom Line True education is not about grades, degrees, or accolades. It's about cultivating a curious, critical, open-minded, empathetic, and humble approach to life. It's about becoming a lifelong learner, a thoughtful citizen, and a compassionate human being. As the philosopher Plutarch put it, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. So there you have it, folks. Life is like a banquet and it's up to us to enjoy it mindfully and meaningfully. Remember, it's not just about rushing through courses, but savoring each moment. What's on your life menu today? Are you tasting the variety or stuck on one flavor? Share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more philosophical bites to enrich your everyday living. Until next time, keep feasting on life.